Um, now it's recording. There you go. And that little red light flashes slowly yep. on and off. Yep. That means that it's working. All right. So, um, quick review of yesterday. All right, which will benefit everybody, but particularly those people who weren't here yesterday. Um, William James. Right. He's talking about whether or not we have any free will when it comes to what we believe. Are we free to believe whatever we want? Somebody like Descartes thinks that, I'll say versus Descartes, because Descartes and people like him are what we call evidentialists. An evidentialist thinks that a belief is rational only if, or to the degree that you have evidence for it, right? So without evidence, belief not rational. That's number one. But number two, Descartes thinks that, if you recall, there's three categories. Things that we understand clearly to be true, things we understand clearly to be false, right? And then things in this category, things that we don't have enough evidence or understanding for, right? So um, let's just put this, things obviously true or false, right? Those we can't help. If it's obviously true, we believe it. If it's obviously false, we don't. Or we disbelieve it. Right? But then there's this thing in the middle where we don't have enough evidence. Descartes says, hold off on this. Remain neutral. Right? You don't know. Like Socrates said, the difference between what you know and you don't know. Just admit. You don't know. Hold back. Don't form an opinion, yes or no. Just remain neutral. Right? Be neutral. Right? And Descartes says, that's where we screw up because we, we believe what we want to believe and we make mistakes, we're not paying attention. If you pay attention, things are obviously either true or false or they're in the gray area. If they're in the gray area, it's gray. So keep it that way. Don't say, yeah, I know it. I believe it. My life depends on it. I couldn't live without that belief. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> That one went by relatively easily. Um, all right. So now, but James, James says, actually, in this same category, right, this category, I'll just say, if three criteria are satisfied, you should not hold back. You shouldn't hold off. Rather, you should form a belief. You should choose. And we, in fact, you can. We, we have some free will. Some free will with regard to beliefs. We don't have any free will about this. We're not free to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is false. Right? We're not free to believe that 2 equals 3. We don't have it. Our mind just can't work that way, right? But when it comes to other things, the example I used yesterday was, maybe I'm not really Repetti, but I'm his twin, mm. right? It's possible. You don't really know. It could be true. It could be false, right? We have a tendency to try and figure it out and guess what's going to happen in the movie and that kind of say, I knew it when it turns out to be true. We didn't know it. It was a lucky guess. That guy. So it's something that it could be true, it could be false, right? We really don't know. Well, that doesn't matter because it doesn't matter to you. It's not important to you, and you don't have to make a choice about whether or not I'm your professor or his twin brother, right? But those three criteria, here they are, one, two, and three. If these three criteria are satisfied, then you do have to, not only can you choose, but you should choose, and really, you must choose. Right? And those three criteria, just to review quickly, uh, not in the same order, is um, mo maybe in the same order, I think. Yeah, momentous, um, live, live option, and don't tell me. It'll come to me. 
necessary. This is what James yeah. is saying, right? Yeah, this is all William James. I contrasted a little bit with Descartes to put it in the ball field for you with what you've already, because you heard what Descartes had said about this after we did the first meditation. I reviewed the other meditations for you, right? Descartes is an evidentialist. James is a pragmatist, which is another word for a practicalist kind of thing. Meaning if it works, it's true. That kind of thing. Right? So, I mean, they don't reject evidence, but they think that evidence might not be the only story. Not yet. I wasn't sure who said um, knowledge and doubt don't go together. Descartes. Okay. Right? Um, okay, so momentous means it really matters. The issue really matters for you. Right? A quick example was, suppose you could get to be the first person who goes to the moon, or Mars, or something like that. That's not something that you go, ah, it doesn't really fit with my schedule. You have to think about it. You, you like maybe miss an opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, it has to be a live option. What does that mean for? It means to you, it means it has to at least be conceivable or possible to you. Right? And what a child, maybe, who believes in things like Santa Claus, right, what's possible for a child, you tell the child, you know, there's a supernatural creature, it's invisible, but it's like right behind me, and it's talking to me right now. The kid might think, that's possible, I don't know if it's true, but it's conceivable. It's a live option, meaning it could be true for you. And what's a live option for you might not be a live option for someone else. The third thing, I mean, if it's not a live option for you, then you certainly you have no free will. That's like, because it's obviously false. Right? You think, like, is it a live option for anyone in the room right now that Santa Claus, the real Santa Claus, is in the cafeteria having a sandwich? No. It's not a real option. Be honest. It's, as far as you're concerned, that's false. So it's not a live option for you. But if it is a live option for you, and it really matters to you, and there's this element of necessity, which means whether you consciously choose or not, you still make a choice. And the example that I gave for that was teenage girl gets pregnant, She's uncertain about whether or not she should have an abortion or abortion's moral. I'm not sure. My life, this, that, and it's all unclear to her. Descartes might say, you don't have enough evidence. Remain neutral. What happens if she remains neutral? She has a baby, right? So she's going to make a choice by not making a choice, right? That's this idea. You're forced to make a choice. Right? Another example, you see somebody in great need, Somebody falls in front of you, they're crying, oh, help me, whatever, and you're in a hurry, you just keep going. Oh, right. Right. Um, and you think, no, I didn't do anything, I just didn't really think about it. I, I remain neutral. You remain neutral? Well, that's a choice. You chose not to help that person, right? So that's the point. So necessity, live option. So let's go through it from two to one and three, right? It has to be a live option for you. It has to be something that matters. And it has to be something that you're really going to, you're making a choice whether you realize it or not. If all three of these are satisfied, you can form a belief. You should, in fact, you will. <laughs> you must, right? So, and all of that is when Descartes says you should hold off. Be neutral because why? Not enough evidence. All right? So, and then... A couple of more things, and then we'll be done with the summary, and then we'll argue about it, because we didn't have much time to do that yesterday. Categories that satisfy all three. Let's just say these three criteria. Social religious, moral, cooperative. And I put another one up there yesterday, but I realize it's just a sort of trend of cooperative. Uh, so we'll start with that one, for instance. Suppose 
you want to be in a band or and time and talent, a team, for instance, for a sport, or even just a game, right? If those things are going to work out, you don't know in advance of the evidence, right? Descartes' attitude is, when you don't have evidence, remain neutral, right? Well, you don't have evidence, but you may take a risk. Now, I'll jump up here to social. The main example is this, is friends. If you use Descartes' strategy, meaning strict about evidence, you'll never have friends. You know, somebody tries to talk to you, they sit in the same class with you, and this, that, and after a while they reach out to you. They say, hey, you know, uh, you want to go have lunch together? Uh, Nah, you know, you think to yourself, now nah, I have a policy, man, I don't know, you could be a serial killer, I, I don't, I have no evidence that you're a decent human being, right. um, so I'm not going to take any risks with you, I'm not going to open myself up to you at all, right, and so you have a big wall and a shell, and then you never find out whether or not somebody's worth having as a friend or a partner or whatever, right, um, moral, same thing, like, we don't know in advance about whether or not a particular thing like having an abortion or, or dating somebody in a different religion or, or whatever it is. So many moral questions that happen to us, we don't really know the answers. So if we just say, oh, I'm going to remain neutral, that means you're not going to do anything which is making a choice, right? So, you know, we have to choose. And it matters. It's, it's momentous, right? And he says the same thing with religious, right? Like life and death and meaning, right? Spirituality, all of these things are very, very important, momentous issues for us as human beings, right? And both sides of the coin of any question that you might raise for one of these things are usually live options for most of us, right? And whether we realize it or not, we're making a choice if we remain neutral about these things and say, well, I'm just going to be an agnostic. I don't know if there's a God or if there's not a God. So I'm going to live the life of an agnostic, which is almost like the life of an atheist, <laughs> right? So then you wind up making a choice indirectly, right? That's the idea, something like that. And if you want to just sort of tighten the argument a little bit, two things I would add is that without taking a risk, oops, a risk, meaning acting or choosing before, I'll put a B, F, a B, a B and a four, before evidence, you will often lose. You'll lose, at least in this one way, you'll lose the opportunity to get the evidence. To even get the evidence. Because it's only by saying, all right, I'll exchange emails with this person. And then you see if they start like flooding your inbox with nonsense emails 24 hours a day, and you go, all right, that was a mistake, right? But if if it starts to work out, you say, this person is reasonable, they, you know, they're not eating up too much of my time, they're respectful, blah, blah, blah. You opened up that door. Now you start to get evidence about whether or not this is somebody that you might want to make friends with. If you had a no evidence, no relationship policy, you'd never get the evidence. Right? Same thing in all these other categories. Now, James's goal here is the religious category, I think. Right? I mean, he's also just talking about whether or not it makes sense to form beliefs when you don't have you know, evidence and whether or not we can, right? And we call this idea of voluntarism, I'll put that on the board because it's a technical term, is the view that there is some free will. Sorry, the view there is some free will with beliefs, with some beliefs, these kinds of I'm sorry, right. what does it say for the fourth category? I think it's 
I don't know where you are. Board band, business. band business project team game. Okay. Um, right? So when it, when you tie this idea like about getting evidence, like you like you you, you have to take a risk and have a pro attitude like maybe it's true or something like that to open yourself up to the possibility of finding out whether or not this is a person worth having a relationship with. Then you get the evidence, right? You have, it has to be an open, alive option for you. Then you take a risk because it's something worthwhile. You're making a choice anyway, so you might as well do it consciously and conscientiously and in a skillful way, right? And then, and only then, do you find out whether or not that's a good person to have on your team or in your band or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, whether that's a person you can have a relationship with and so on, right? And then the tie-in, the last point, which is what I was getting to about religion, is that it may very well be that for all we know, God not only exists, right? If he does, it's certainly momentous. It's not something you would want to ignore. In fact, it'd be better for you to ignore the possibility of taking that trip to Mars, right? That's less momentous than ignoring God if he really exists, right? And you might not realize it, but if you choose to ignore God, you're making a choice about God. <laughs> Whether he exists or not, you don't know, but you're making a choice, right? So you have to make a choice, all right? Unfortunately for some people, some scientifically oriented atheists, let's just say, it's not a live option. For them, it's like, is this an option for them? Two equals three? No. <laughs> it's just not an option. Santa Claus? No. Just not an option. God? Same category for them. So it's not an option, so they don't have any free will about that. Think about that for a moment. If they can't make themselves think that it's possible, they're not at fault. <laughs> and if God is fair, God wouldn't judge them because he knows they can't believe in him. <laughs> it's an interesting thing. Um, so one last thing, and then I'll, we'll open up the floor. Right? At the last thing. God might be like a friend. Because he might be like a person. Could be radically unlike a person in many ways, but if there's any which way in which God could be in a relationship with you of any kind, then he could be like a friend or a person, and then that's like someone you ignore and choose not to shake hands with or exchange emails with, right? You've just done that to God, <laughs> right? But now, if you open up to the possibility of relating to God, then all the possible evidence might come to you that all the other believers have. Right? Things just worked out in my life. I always narrowly averse disaster. I have dreams that come true. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, there's tons of evidence for God, the believer thinks. But the atheist who thinks that's in this category, he can never even see the evidence. He's got blinders on. There's no such thing. That's not real evidence. That's some kind of stupidity to the atheist. Right? So, ironically, the atheist and the scientist, right, this stuff, by the way, things that are obviously true, uh, let's just put obviously true or false, right? Math and science. Things in these categories, right? Even James thinks it's either true or false, a mathematical statement or a scientific statement. We know we can prove math easily. A lot of scientific things we don't have the proof for, but we should wait. If there's no proof, wait until the scientists give us the proof, because they will. And that's not momentous. Like, who cares if Pluto is a planet or not? It doesn't matter to us. We'll let the scientists figure it out and report it back to us. Right? But these kinds of things matter. All right? So it's ironic that the evidentialist, um, who's supposed to be the expert about what's rational to believe, right? What's rational to believe? Only things with evidence. Right? is cut off from all the evidence by being, in a sense, closed-minded to the fact that it could even exist. So the pragmatist, who says if it works, it's true, 
Right? The, the, the evidentialist thinks that those people are really just being sloppy. It's sort of like, well, it's true for me, you know, astrology, this, that. That's the attitude that they have towards everybody else, like as if it's some hokey nonsense, right? But really, if James is right, <laughs> All right. So wait, Al had his hand up first, and then David. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was close. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll come back to you. Um, David. Good thing I remembered. But uh, superstition. What about that? Like, um, how about people like uh, know, bad luck and all that, and then they believe like seeing a black cat gives them bad luck, and if it gives them a bad luck every single time. Really That's the whole thing with the evidentialist thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, right, so, so they continue believing in superstition and the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, do you hear what he's saying? So, so it's now, like, uh, when, it, when you see it, it really happens, right? Yeah, like you see the black cat, okay, and then you see like you, you lose $10, okay? You know what I'm oh, saying? Like every time, whatever. Like, that doesn't mean that the black cat is responsible for you losing $10, though. That's a really interesting objection, right? Think about what he's saying. Right? If you're a believer, like James is saying, you, you, when you open yourself up to evidence from God, Christians and others call that grace. Right? You have to take one step toward God, and then God will take a thousand toward you. God's grace is on you. Right? Um, and you see it in your life. Right? Excuse me? Okay. Uh, no. Look, there may be various different interpretations of this idea, but the point is, if the soul opens up to God, right, God does not ignore that. God answers your prayers, that kind of thing. So if you open up to God, the possibility of God, you reach out to God, you take a risk on God, etc., this argument, at least what James is trying to say, is that maybe that's what's necessary for you to start seeing signs that God is real in your life. And believers often call that God's grace, that lucky coincidences and things like that, all sorts of narrowly averted disasters, the opposite of the black cat, one moment, right? We take those things as signs of faith, like miracles and whatnot and so on, so dreams that come true, whatever, right? I just, I managed very luckily today, right, to get my hands on five gallons of gas, just being in the right place at the right time. There's a Muslim grocer at the corner where I live, who I've been friends with for like 35 years or something like that. And across the street is a gas station, and they're Muslims, and they talk to each other. They're very good friends. I don't know the guy in the gas station, right? But he told me he could hook me up if I got one of those jugs. If I get, but I couldn't get one. I ran around town trying to get one. I came back and said, I can't get one. You sure you don't know anybody who has one? Right? And the customer in the store, who he didn't even know, said, I have one right now. I can lend it to you. Go ahead. Go get it. And the, the Muslim guy goes, inshallah, this guy, you know, all this kind of, Allah's grace, you know, you see how it works, Ricky, you're always helping people, right? That might count as evidence. That's this grace thing. If you're a believer, you think those kinds of things happen to you. What David is saying, and let me just, I want to spell this out before we hear your answer, is that what about when you have an open live option towards evil things, like superstition and black cats and the devil and all that, and you think, uh-oh, there's a black cat, and then, you know, you slip and break a hip, and this and that, and like, so are you opening yourself up to evil, or is it all psychosomatic? I don't know which of those two you meant. So you well, say that first, and then we'll go to them. I've had, like, plenty of times where, like, my friends, like, one in the past, like, I'm not Satanist, but I've had friends who were Satanist and then turned back into normal, whatever, but <laughs> at the time that they were Satanist, they were like, please... Are you trying to suggest that Satanists are not normal? <laughs> All right, but, but um, you know what I'm saying? Like, they, they would pray to Satan, and then they'd, like, they would give, like, let me get a, Satan, please let me get a cigarette. And they would go to the park and find a full pack with one cigarette missing. Like, you know what I'm saying? We, I even tried it on myself. I was like, all right, um, let me get a cigarette, right? I did the same thing, right? And then my friend was like, let me get a bottle of Visine. And at that moment, we walked down the block, and there's a full bottle of Visine, all dirtied up and unopened, like, sealed on the floor, it, like, all dirtied up. No one would notice it but us. You know what I'm saying? Like, and we get that. And then some random guy's like, hey, guy, you want to come to this party with me? I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> like, was I going to get killed at that moment? Like, if I took another opportunity? Yeah, keep praying to say, and don't party <laughs> people on the street invite you to that. Good strategy, Dave. But, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
I don't believe um, in it though, you know what I'm saying? Al <laughs> remembered what he wanted to say and then no, we'll get to that. This is actually about this. That's fine. I, you can jump the line. I, she talks all the time. Oh, no, no. Easy pass. So, when he was just talking about the, like, just events leading up to one another, I have that happen, but not with, like, Satan stuff, more like arguing or whatever. So, it's like, <laughs> like say, say I come to one party, and then it's like, okay, this party's done, whatever. And I just, as soon as I'm about to go home, I see somebody that I know, or they call me, like, yo, what's going on? You're going to this party. So, because I, I don't have a car yet, they're like, okay, so we'll drop. So we got to that party, this and that. So, so there's a party angel. That's sort of, I mean, that's other times that. too, like you know, other stuff. But like, well, yeah. That, so that's so my that's, phone tweeting. So, so that's oh. so that's like one way where I understand. I um, forgot to shut it. Where he's talking about. And another thing is about the um, superstition thing. Yeah. Like my mom, when like I mean, like good things happen with um, currently, recurrently. She's like, oh, praise God, praise God, this, this, and that. My mom, the, like she, she believes in superstition a lot. So say something bad happens, I used to say like, I think it makes it hard for a person to blame themselves for the thing happen for for the bad things that happen to them. Because my mom, like if if I leave something on the floor or whatever, she would pick it up. And if, if she's picking it up and she puts it in the down, she turns around, she she hits something. She's gonna blame me, as in like, oh, because I didn't pick that up. up. And <laughs> something else bad is gonna happen during the day. It's gonna be like, oh, well, my head got messed up because early in the day you you got me you got me mad and now now this happened to me. It's like. Um, so what is the part where you actually like, cause your own, like, I don't know. Yeah, that's another exactly. really interesting problem with both of these strategies. Yeah. You know, so and so that's so. part of, and all of this reasoning ties into that one belief that I talked about on day one. Mm -hmm. That many of us have, but not all of us do, the following. Everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. Now, if all the bad things and all the good things and the accidents and the intended, it all, if it all happens, then what's... Like, how, how does that make sense? How do you keep track of that? How, how could you ever prove that that was true or false? Or even have a really good reason? Because the satanic stuff and the angelic stuff, it all seems to be happening for a reason. Are the reasons outside of you? And just you're a victim of it all? It's all just happening to you? Or are you making choices? And that's the reason why you have the experiences that you do. Yeah, it, it, it could... Like, I think it leads into many other things, not even like angelic or satanic. Like, say, okay, I'm not, I, I'll use myself, like, I, I do business, right? So, say, like, I just come into a place, I put a few cards down, whatever, or I make a um, business uh, meeting, and then I just happen to see somebody that, that, else, that, that also wants business or that I can use to enhance my business. Like, maybe they do cards, maybe they do graphic designing. Or whatever. So, yeah, so, so it's like, instead of me having to look, look like on many places if there's been times where I just came one place I'm like oh wait you do this oh that's cool take my number down oh you know somebody else does that and it, it's just like one after the other good things are happening well so. right but but um so so here's the question do you think that this is the invisible hand of some kind of mysterious system of reasons that's connecting you with people or do you think you've developed an operational strategy of being sensitive to the possibility of networking and putting yourself out there so that you're in the kinds of places at the kinds of times and your antenna's up and so that's how you function well in that world. I think it's like more of like your mind state. And, and so it's coming more from you. And, and, and no, no, not even more from me because I think earlier in the class, the semester we were talking about like, oh, karma, the world karma, the world's karma and all that, and like things relating. Karma. So it's like, it's all like, about the law like, of attraction. Yeah, so, so it's like, so if you're a good person, well, like, you know, good people die very vicious deaths, but like, yeah. no, no, if you're a good person, like, good things happen Gangsters like, tend to notice and interact with other gangsters. Yeah, yeah, you know, so like, I think it's more <laughs> of like just having that mind state and just being, um, just, I don't know, just being that. Yeah, okay, yeah. Lauren has been waiting for quite a while, yeah. so. No, I mean, they kind of kind of cover everything that I wanted is just like I just want to make the point that um okay let me like this way let's say that you have a, a sick some a love sick one and um you're praying that they will get better but even if the doctor tell them getting better you they keep getting worse now I'm not gonna say well God is not answering my prayer or you know God is not intervening I don't know why maybe that's just the way that that person life supposed to go and maybe you know me praying and Things are remaining the same doesn't mean that God doesn't answer my prayer. 
You notice how we're coming from? Yes, I do. But so, so I'm just, so I'm just saying, regardless of how it, whether um, it's something good continually happening or something bad continually happening, what's the cause? I'm not gonna say, well, oh, when like when things are going good with me, okay, God is on my side, and if things go bad, I mean, God has left me, or that there's something I've done. Maybe that's just that's just the way it is. You think it's a story of. You know, when you read in the newspapers about maybe somebody got killed in a park or so yeah. a car pulled up and they shot a guy in the head, and you think, oh my God, how horrible is that? But maybe the guy who got killed really had it come, like it was a, it was revenge killing or something like that, right? Like you don't know, right? So like when it comes to karma, we don't know what people's karma is, right? So it could be karma. Remember the maybe thing? Maybe the brakes weren't working. And that's why I crashed into you. But were the brakes working? You don't know. Maybe they weren't working. That doesn't really get you off the hook. Or, right? If they weren't working, that gets you off the hook. Of course, maybe they weren't working. Similarly, when we see terrible things happen, we think, well, maybe it's their karma. Maybe it's this. Maybe God has a plan. It's all maybe stuff. Right? How do you do the math? How do you try to tally up that there's a system of reasons? Like, Because this is a theory. There's a system of reasons that's orderly, and it involves justice and things according to a plan, right? Any other theory, you can make predictions. If the theory is true, we should see this and that. Like, if evolution is true, we should see genetics in common, and we do. If evolution is true, we should see fossils at different er eras in the Earth, and we do, right? These are theories that, if it's a theory that has a, makes a real claim, then there are things that we should see if it's true. Now, this theory, the system of reasons theory, Everything that we see could either support it or not support it, because we never know. It's just totally mysterious. It's like, maybe the world is only five minutes old. Maybe we're brains and bats. It's a maybe theory. It's like, like when the killing happens in the newspaper, you don't know, is it justice or the opposite of justice? If you don't know the full picture, and we never do, you can't know. And I'm trying to say that that applies all the time, whether it's the black cat thing, or my getting the gas today. <laughs> and it's not like, yeah, I agree. You Like, whether or not you adopt the attitude that James is saying, of think, let's just say, that shouldn't be like, like a totally sensitive weather vane that every time something good happens to you, you go, God exists. And every time you have a headache, God doesn't exist. I agree with that, yeah, that right? Because that would be like a hyper-reactive weather vane, right? But your, your belief in anything shouldn't be completely immune to the evidence, either. <laughs> There's some kind of balance in there between Descartes and Hospers. You know what I mean? All right, so one, two, three. I was going to mention something like on the gas thing when you were saying, like, uh, the guy told you it's because you do the good things all the time. See, that's, right. that's his view of me, because he knows me, and I've helped him a lot. Exactly. He, like He knows I have some good karma, but he doesn't know about my bad karma. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, you know, like, if, for example, like, if I were to help someone in the middle of the street, I'm, you know what I'm saying, I'm not doing that just for good karma, I'm just doing that just right. because, and then all of a sudden someone sees me doing that, uh, that's not my intention, but suddenly they will see me do that, and then they will act better, you know, that's the way, like, that I would think, like, if a God really exists, it's throughout society. It's throughout you doing good and society looking at you. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. if you're going out there robbing cars during the middle of the hurricane, you know what I'm saying, and not giving the property back to the guys afterwards, you know what I'm saying, that, that will... There are evidentialists... Let me put it this way. Hold on, Lorna. There are people who believe in evidentialism, let's just say, who don't believe in anything mysterious... Right? But who think that there's a kind of natural version of the law of karma that makes sense along the kind of lines that you're saying. Hmm. The way that we act and interact with others, we develop dispositions and tendencies, and it's attraction, and this and that, and there's chains of reaction and whatnot, and there's a kind of naturalized, not supernaturalized version of the law of karma, or the law of attraction, and all that. Whether or not it's deeper and more mysterious, I don't know. So, um, Magniat, and then... Al and then Lauren. I just want to say something. 
Well, he said, um, if you, sometimes people say when they see a black cat, right, and something bad happens. Is it because you think it, or, I don't know. Yeah. It does happen to some people when they see something, like, And that's, that's the power of suggestion, maybe, like, what they say, with voodoo, you have to believe in it, right? If you believe in it, and you see the witch doctor put the death whammy on you, you're in trouble, right? Um, <laughs> but if you don't believe in it, you're one of these guys, obviously, Paul, you'll laugh at it, and most likely, nothing will happen to you. Um, that's part of what he's talking about. If you believe in black cats, use the same strategy, it'll get you in trouble. Because up here, if you mess with your own mind and think, well, something is happening. Ah, but wait, you can't make that distinction because when you believe in God, that's something up here, the AD no, no, says. No, no, no. I'm just saying something about that, right? Say, okay, say, I'm, every time I see a black cat, right? I'm $10. Right. Say, how about say, I don't, I'm not okay with the black cat, right? I'm just telling my friend, you know what? Can you just hold this money for me and see if I'm still going to do something or not? <laughs> I don't know. It's just, I but don't that would be interesting to start performing experiments. But then you see, the point is, how do you keep track of all of your karma? It? It's hard enough for me to keep track of my actual bank account, <laughs> right? <laughs> but all the thoughts and motives and emotions and reactions and mental judgments, I catch myself doing this all the time as I'm walking down the hall saying, oh my God, look at those sneakers. I would never wear those. You know, I'm very judgmental in my, rea in my unconscious habitual conditioning reactions, but I'm aware of it, and I'm constantly trying to temper it, right? Like, there's a million different dimensions of karma, if karma's real, and how do you keep track of that? A, B, most people who believe in karma believe in reincarnation. Now, if that was true, right, if there was reincarnation and karma, right, that would, or could rather, that could explain everything that ever happens to anybody. Because you never know what you did in your last lifetime. And then, see, like, it's hard for Christians to explain when an innocent, innocent child gets killed or tortured and killed, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're a, a Hindu or a Buddhist and you believe in reincarnation and karma, you think, well, maybe they, they did that to someone else in their last lifetime or whatever, right? So, like, that theory has more power to explain what seems like tremendous injustice those religions can explain it better than Judaism and Christianity and Islam can because they believe in reincarnation, right? But just like I said about every other theory, those are maybe theories. But those maybe theories would do a better job of explaining it. It's harder to explain why an innocent child is destroyed if you don't believe that there's another life before this one. But if you believe that there's an endless number of them before this, then you believe, like, well, it's not a big deal. It happens to all of us at some point. But we've all done it. We've all got it coming to us. That's one of the lures and attractions of those religions, that they seem to make more sense to many people, because they would explain a lot more. Al? Yeah, um, going to what you just said, there could also be another reason why some of these things happen, like... Um, I know, for instance, a, bat, a certain basketball tournament was um, brought about because some kid got killed um, that was playing ball. Right. So now, ever since then, like they named the tournament, they named the tournament after um, the child that died. So maybe that one horrific death could have um, is, is, is like it, it changed something and right. led to many people, many kids in the neighborhood being saved because now they have a tournament to keep them busy to. to all right, so here's two different ways of looking at that, right? And that's without using religious sense, because I'm trying to... Like, right, well, that's what I wanted to say. There's two ways of looking at it. One, three. Well, there's at least two. I'm sorry. There's another way of looking at it. There's your way, which is the way that you just described, which is totally secular. Which means death, that maybe death is greater than us. You know, not, not even from a, uh, somebody that believes, okay, God has a reason why. Or, 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 or the example you gave, which is like um, reincarnation. Maybe it's death is bigger than us. It doesn't mean that we did something in our past life, but it doesn't mean that we have to believe in a certain God. It could just mean that, you know, one... Death is a very God. meaningful part of life. Yeah. And when and it's meaningful things come out of death, mm -hmm. right, the question I was going to ask you is about different ways of interpreting that. A, is it part of that larger scheme of reasons? That's a possibility. B, um, is it just that we want to make the best out of the worst? 
you know, turning, what is it called, lemons into lemonade, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, that, that's something we do, that's something we create, we're not discovering some greater purpose, we're creating one, Sometimes right? so those are two, that's just a contrast pair, yeah. there may be many other ways of looking at that, like, God has a precise plan, and that was in the script, <laughs> And what we see, the better things that come out of it, that's only a small part of the tremendous better things that come out of everything according to God's plan. So that's more like a third theory. And then there's the karma theory, the reincarnation. There's a million different possible... But Which is like, well, we made, we made it meaningful by, 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 you know, honoring that death and trying to turn it around, make it positive, and all that. Yeah. Right? So, doesn't mean the other theories are false. No, it doesn't at all. Same a actually, the, if, whether um, the first, the first or the second theory, they can actually take from that one. So a person that believes in God... Right, can anybody can accept the fact that we did something good with that, mm -hmm. that loss. And they could be like, oh, okay, God, God did it for a reason. What is she what? hardly ever speaks. Okay, okay. Okay. No, no, no. Go ahead. You had your hand up, no? Yeah. Um, no, I was going to say that Judaism also has a, this concept of reincarnation. Tell me about that, because I hear different things from different Jews. There's different there's different traditions within right. Judaism. So. so I grew up with a with an intellectual um, view of it. So there is the concept of reincarnation and the fact that your your soul chooses um, the situation it's going to be in, be to not really to atone for whatever it might have done before. But it won't put itself into into a situation that it can't handle. So if something bad happens to you, you don't necessarily go and blame God because you didn't. You're not in a situation that you couldn't handle. You picked your life you curriculum your before life. you were born. Right. Either because to work you, out your particular right, issues. Right. So. Let's say not necessarily like things you might have done in another life, but let's say traits you have. So let's say in a you know at one point you were really selfish. You were really you were, you were just a not nice person. Maybe in the next life you'll give yourself more trials to improve yourself. So every time you have to struggle with not having or not doing that, it's to improve. That's interesting. I, I don't know if, if reincarnation is a, an official doctrine in any form of Judaism, actually, but I've heard this from many different Jews. It actually Jews. is. Um, I, I believe it's in, okay, I think I know the book, um, it's in the first one by, I can say it in Hebrew. Um, say it in Hebrew. Um, the first book of the Torah? Yeah, um, it goes by... Genesis is in the first right, book. Genesis is... Uh, they believe that when, when it was given down, all the souls were, were present, not necessarily people who were alive. Right. So Sinai or something? Yeah, all so by souls. Sinai, all the souls were present. You Therefore, hear this? Even if you weren't Even if you weren't physically there, your soul was present. Right. So there, th with but that... The souls existed before they were born. That doesn't imply that they're born it, twice. It doesn't... Here, I'm going to... Okay, good, good. It does imply it because it was going to be... You're going to be born, and if you... Because you're present, you're going to continue living on. So the fact that your soul's in existence, it may not be in physical form, but it will continue. So whether or not you'll be born again, you most likely will be. It says that you need to continue improving on yourself until the end. And Do you know which book of... This, like... Um, there's Genesis, there's Leviticus, you know, which... Do you know which... Okay, Find out and bring that information It's from Midbar. Who? It's funny. Um, <laughs> uh, That's okay. So Find I, out and let I me can, know. I can get you the English one. I'm curious to hear that. Um, you know about reincarnation with Christianity? Did I tell you this thing? No. For the Christians in the room. The rabbis who doubted that Jesus was the Messiah frequently challenged him. Right? According to the prophecy, the Mashiach, the Messiah, is supposed to satisfy all these different prophetic criteria. Right? There's a whole list of them. And um, one of them was Elijah, the prophet Elijah, Old Testament, Jewish, biblical prophet, was supposed to come and announce that the Messiah was coming to, pre you know, introduce him or something, and marshal in his presence. And so the rabbi said, Jesus... Uh, if you're the Messiah, where's Elijah? And he said, he came, but you beheaded him. Exactly. I'm but glad you filled that in for me. Hold on. Listen. Wait, wait, wait. Go Pause. Back. What? The rabbi said, if you're the Messiah, the prophecy says, Elijah is supposed to come before the Messiah does. Come back and announce that the Messiah is coming. Yeah. And, Jesus, and he said, 
Well, and Jesus said, he came, but you beheaded him. Right? And who, who was he referring to? John the Baptist, because he was out in the wilderness saying, Messiah is coming. The Lord is coming. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And he was baptizing people and all that. And he baptized when he Jesus, baptized right? Jesus, Jesus said that he was greater than him. Elijah, he was referring to. Most theologians who know about this in every form of Christianity take Jesus to be saying, John the Baptist was Elijah. That's part A. Hold on. Part B. When Mary, Jesus' mother, and either her sister or cousin, who John the Baptist's mother, got together, they were both pregnant at the same time. And yeah, yeah. I, I think it was Elizabeth? Yeah, Elizabeth. John's mother was Elizabeth, and they were Mary's sister or her cousin, I forget. But uh, they were related. When they got together, when they were both pregnant, their bellies kicked. The babies <laughs> recognized each other in the womb. That's in the Bible. Okay? So, why do I mention that? Because it shows Jesus and John were both born. Right? They were incarnate in the flesh. They didn't come out of the sky. If Elijah or John the Baptist came down from heaven as a fully grown adult, it wouldn't be reincarnation. But he was born in the womb. And there's evidence that he was born in the womb. Right? And Jesus said, he's, John the Baptist is the guy, Elijah. Right? To satisfy the prophecy. So, the point is, Elijah, Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist, New Testament prophet, same guy, that's reincarnation. Did you want to say something about that? That's for the Christians. Okay, so, why didn't we agree with that? Because according to us, Elijah never died. Elijah, she's Elijah. Elijah. Yeah, because never died. the Bible speaks well, in a way so about Elijah that it's not clear that he actually died. He yes. went up. That right, was no, Elijah. Was shot. Okay. There was still up there. There was Elijah. Shot out one. Yeah. 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 We're talking about Elijah. Right. Yeah. Not Elijah. 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 Somebody else in time. Yeah. Talking about Elijah and the Bible, the the Jewish Bible. I've heard this many times from my Jewish students. Said that's the first objection that they make against this is that it's not clear, it's left vague whether or not Elijah died and went with God or he just went up with God, up like ascension. Elijah did die, Elijah did not die, he was transformed. Well, it doesn't matter because even if Elijah didn't die, right. No, that just brings up the whole reincarnation issue. If Whether die, Elijah died reincarnate. or not, Elijah lived in the flesh in an earlier lifetime and then was born in the womb for Christians. For Christian theory. Like for Christians, Christians yeah. as John the Baptist. That's a form well, of reincarnation. Well, you know what? Let me just say a quick thing. When the Bible said, when, when Jesus said that Elijah, it's not Elijah himself, the Bible said the spirit of Elijah was the spirit of Elijah that came. So, it wasn't Elijah in, in, a, in a body form, it was the spirit indwelling in another body, which was... Well, what that's reincarnation. The spirit is the soul. The spirit is not the soul. The spirit in the body. I thought spirit and soul the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but remember what we said? What? Well, you guys got to read William, that? William James said, like with the days of creation, that was my example. If you have a problem with the age of the earth because of science, then you say, well, maybe the word day means something like a whole eon, right? To change the meaning of the word day, problem is gone. So now spirit and soul, maybe they're not identical, it's not a problem anymore. That's making the smallest possible adjustment so that you get to retain all of your beliefs and continue to think that Christians shouldn't believe in reincarnation. I don't believe in reincarnation. I just said that. <laughs> Alright, thank you folks. It was a tangent, but it was, it was fun. Real <laughs> quick. Anybody came after I took attendance today? No. Good. Do you have a lot of class right now? Yes, I do. You can talk to me for a few minutes. Find out what the chapter is. It's the same one. 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 It's the same